It is 1945. World War II is ongoing, but finally winding down. Germany is on the brink of surrender. Italy long has already. But Japan fights on. The ship you are on is making her way through the war-torn Pacific Ocean. But she has been guaranteed safe passage, and she carefully has made her way around a minefield. She is massive, was built for luxury, and has survived direct attack from torpedoes before. Rumored to be inside her hull, a priceless cargo of gold and precious metals. It is a Japanese ship you are on, but due to an agreement with the United States, the ship is guaranteed safe passage, and the U.S. knows what her route is. She sails with her lights on, and the ship is making regular check-ins on the radio and announcing her position so everyone knows she is a vessel not to be sunk. All is well. But then... Due to a case of mistaken identity on the part of an overeager submarine captain, you have been attacked, and you are trapped below. All around you, the ship creaks and cracks as water floods the halls. Soon, the lights slowly begin to dim and burn out, and you are left trapped inside, deep within the vessel, in utter darkness, and it sinks out from underneath you. Out of the 2,000 people on board the ship with you, one will survive. The ship is the Awamaru, and this is the story of her horrific sinking. History is full of horrifying ship disasters. The Titanic, Lusitania, Arctic, Lord Spencer, the White Ship. But this is up there with the very worst, and most terrifying. Fog, overeagerness, fatal human errors, will all contribute to one of the most needless losses of life in the Second World War. The Awamaru was laid down in 1941 and launched the next year and completed the year after that. She was in service from 1943 to 1945. She was 502 feet long, had a beam of 66 feet, and weighed 11,249 gross registered tons. During World War II, the Imperial Japanese Navy requisitioned this luxury passenger liner for war service. She made multiple runs to Singapore throughout the war, carrying ammunition and supplies, as well as making trips carrying troops to Burma throughout 1943 and 1944. Awamaru was also part of the Hai 71 convoy and carried Japanese reinforcements to the Philippines during the war. She also made trips into the South China Sea. In August of 1944, Awamaru was actually part of a convoy that was attacked by the USS Rasher, Bluefish, and Spadefish. She was one of several ships torpedoed that night, but she was able to make a successful run to shallow water and beached herself there and was prevented from sinking. She was repaired in Singapore later and returned to Japan the next year. In January 1945, the Japanese and United States governments made an agreement with one another. Despite still being at war, they agreed to allow the safe passage of various ships with the task of carrying Red Cross and other relief supplies to American and other allied POWs being held by the Japanese. Awamaru was one such ship. She was then painted green with large white crosses on each side of her hull, and other ships with this task also had their sailing schedule sent to all submarines with orders that they were to be left alone. This message was broadcast three times, three nights in a row. At night, the ship would sail with all running lights on and with special spotlights on and aimed at her crosses. It is now March 28, 1945. Awamaru is docked in Singapore having delivered vital Red Cross supplies for Allied POWs, and she is now taking on hundreds of stranded merchant marine officers, military personnel, diplomats, as well as a likely cargo of nickel, rubber, lead, tin, and sugar, and possibly a few priceless items as well. According to some sources, military contraband was also smuggled aboard by the Japanese troops in secret, and some evidence of this would soon be floating on the ocean surface. Now, on March 28th, Awamaru is departing Singapore with cargo and her passengers. Knowing she has been guaranteed safe passage by the United States, she makes way and is due to arrive at her destination on April 4th. There are 2,071 people on board. For a few days, all is well. The ship is left alone as ordered, and she sends a radio message at noon on April 1st, announcing her position. This is the last message that would ever come from the ship.
The USS Queenfish was a Baleo-class submarine, her namesake coming from the same fish found off the Pacific coast of North America. She was laid down in Maine in 1943 and launched in November of that year. She was able to achieve a speed of 20.25 knots on the surface and 8.75 when submerged. She could dive to 400 feet, was 311 feet long, and had a beam of 27 feet. Her patrols began in August of 1944, and during this patrol, she sunk the tanker Chiyota Maru north of the Philippines at 21 degrees, 21 minutes north, 121 degrees, 6 minutes east. Throughout her patrols over the next eight months, she would sink six more Japanese ships, including the aircraft escort carrier Akitsu Maru in November 1944. The other vessels she sank included the passenger and cargo vessel Toyoko Maru, the transport ship Manchu Maru, the cargo vessels Keijo Maru and Hako Maru, and the ex-gunboat Cho Jetson Maru. Then that brings us to April 1945. She is on patrol in the Pacific Ocean, and the submarine spots what they believe to be a destroyer making her way through the fog. Commander of the Queen's Fish, Charles E. Lachlan, first spotted the ship on radar at 17,000 yards. Awamaru is sailing at 17 knots, and her visibility is down to 200 yards. Awamaru is not blowing her horn, one of the signs that she was not to be torpedoed or attacked under the international treaty. And due to her heavily loaded cargo hold, Awamaru is low in the water and appears smaller than she really is on radar. Lachlan slows his ship down to four knots and swings her around to take a shot at the unknown ship. Moving into a distance of 1,200 yards, using radar range and bearing, he orders four torpedoes to be fired. He has not actually seen the ship he is shooting at. All four torpedoes strike the Awamaru. She sank in two minutes. Awamaru goes down in 200 feet of water and crashes to the ocean floor. Four gaping holes in her hull, this once beautiful, luxurious ship now a wreck on the ocean floor. She takes with her all those on board, save one. Kentora Shimoda, the captain's personal steward, was the sole survivor of the sinking. It was the third time he was the sole survivor of a torpedoed ship. None of the others among the crew and none of the passengers survived. Also around this time in history are when the fossils of the Peking Man, which were last known to be in Singapore, disappear. What happened to them is unknown, but it is theorized that they went the same way as the fossils on the Mount Temple did. Because it is thought that a very probable explanation for the disappearance of the fossilized bones of this human ancestor is that they likely went down with the ship. A true blow to scientists studying human origins and extra salt in the wound of this tragedy. It is very likely they were completely obliterated in the initial explosions, if they were indeed on board. Let it go by safely was the order given to the submarine captains if they saw the Awamaru, along with the description of her. What was Lachlan's reaction to this? This is the most stupid dispatch I have ever seen in my life. It's addressed to every submarine from Australia to north of Japan. How the hell are we supposed to know where the Awamaru is? It was later stated in official records after the sinking, she, the Awamaru, was carrying a cargo of rubber, lead, tin, and sugar. 1,700 merchant seamen and 80 first-class passengers, all survivors of ship sinkings, were being transported from Singapore to Japan. The survivor said no Red Cross supplies were on board, they having been previously unloaded. Queenfish never once saw the ship through the fog. Her crew merely saw her blip on radar blink out once she sank. When Kentaro Shimoda was picked up by the Queenfish, he told them who they had torpedoed, and she searched for more survivors, but found none. It had already been six hours after Kentaro had been rescued by then, and no one was left to save, if they would have even allowed themselves to be. Only Kentaro allowed himself to be plucked from the sea. More survivors had been at the scene earlier, but refused rescue attempts. Some even dove down into the oily water and drowned themselves. 
By the end of her second search over a day later, Kintera was still the only survivor. When news reached the mainland from her captain, Queenfish was ordered back to port. All the submarine found at the scene of the sinking was 2,000 bales of barbed rubber floating in the sea, which were seized as evidence of the ship carrying contraband. Queenfish's captain was relieved of command, was tried by court-martial, and convicted of negligence in obeying orders. He never again would command a submarine and received a letter of admonition from the Secretary of the Navy. Queenfish went on to rescue 13 airmen 100 miles west of Iwo Jima a few weeks after the sinking of the Awa Maru. She would later sink an unnamed Japanese fishing vessel on July 4, 1945. She would be stationed at Midway, preparing for another patrol when the war ended. She was sunk as a target in 1963. The U.S. government offered, through neutral Switzerland, to replace Awa Maru with a ship of similar proportions to her. A furious Japan demanded a full reimbursement of $45 million for the ship and $7.25 million for the goods and lives, bringing the total to a $52.5 million demanded payment. In spring of 1949, the Japanese government abandoned all compensation rights related to the sinking of the Awa Maru as a show of appreciation for the rebuilding efforts by the United States in Japan following the end of the war. 1977, the wreck of the Awa Maru was located 10 miles off the coast of China. Throughout 1979, 1980, and 1981, thousands of artifacts and human remains were returned to Japan by the Chinese salvage team, who were searching for a rumored cargo of billions worth of gold. No such cargo was ever actually on board the ship. You're standing on the shore of Nova Scotia, looking north. It is cold. The water laps at the stones at your feet. And the strait is empty. That is, until you see something sailing by. A beautiful ship with white sails, three masts, and she is completely engulfed in flames, awestruck with horror. You watch as the specter from a bygone age silently sails by you in silence and disappears along with all traces of her did you even just see that you are not crazy you are now one of many people over 200 years who have seen this exact ship sail by in the way you just did but what is her story why does she just drift by always in flames where does she come from where does she go and why does she seem to be trapped in a loop? This is the story of the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait. She is not the most widely known ghost ship, but her story is intriguing. The mystery is fascinating. And the theory and lore goes very deep with this one. Perhaps she has a greater purpose to continue to sail long after her time than any of us think. And there are few things that send a chill down my spine more than a ghost ship. So, let's set sail.
The exact year that the first part of our story occurred in is not clear. I've seen different years thrown around, and I'm just going to go with one of them that I saw. In 1786, the residents of Prince Edward Island awoke to an eerie sight. Trepidation spread throughout the town. A ship was on the horizon, gliding eerily, lifelessly, toward shore under her own power. No one was on deck. No one was hailing those on shore. And no one was replying to the hails from the islanders. No one knew where she came from, who she was, or where her crew was. The ship came near to shore, and the residents on the island could make out some of the details. She was a schooner, her rigging was in good shape, and her sails were furled. But sails ready to catch the wind, well-maintained rigging, and a nice-looking ship are all pointless if the crew is nowhere to be seen. Residents quickly launched an investigation of the mysterious schooner drifting towards them. Rowing out, their calls still went unanswered, and when they boarded, they found the ship deserted. Now, this is almost a century before the story of the Mary Celeste, so that story didn't have any kind of influence on this legend. The ship was deserted. There was no sign of her crew at all. She was abandoned. She also had no marks, no name, papers, anything that could be found. It's like she was a ghost. She disappeared with no one on board and had no name to be called. She was fully provisioned with food, water, anything her crew would need, so where were they? And another similarity to the Mary Celeste, she also showed no signs of foul play, of any kind of struggle, anything. It was like everyone stopped what they were doing and jumped ship randomly. All indications were that the crew left the ship willingly, leaving behind everything they had. Mutiny, sickness, pirates, paranormal activity were all suggested explanations for why the ship was found in the state it was in. Perhaps pirates had boarded and taken the crew, then abandoned the ship, but there was no sign of violence. This also seems to disprove the mutiny theory. Sickness might have broken out and the crew abandoned ship to escape or seek medical assistance, but that second one really doesn't make any sense, and there was also no evidence for this. There was no makeshift hospital or quarantine area inside the ship. No trace of who owned the ship or who her crew was were ever found. There were efforts made to track down who it might have been, but there were no papers on board, the ship had no name, and there was just nothing to identify her. So the trail went cold. Yeah, probably Spino. Ever since this event, over 200 years ago, the ship is still seen to this day, sailing into the strait, just like she did all those years ago, always described as a beautiful schooner, a bright white and gold ship, with white sails which burst into flames as she passes you. According to locals, the ghost ship always comes before a storm and serves as a warning. That is interesting. It almost sounds like the ship is a guardian for the people who found her now. That's kind of cool. I like that idea a lot, that the ship itself now serves as a guardian for those who found her all those years ago. That is strangely wholesome. <sighs> Fine. Back to the regularly scheduled scary horror mystery I do here. The ghost ship does supposedly come when there is a wind from the northeast, serving as a warning for bad weather to come. Other stories vary somewhat in how the ship is described, but overall the shape is the same. Sometimes witnesses say they can see phantom crew members climbing the masts. Others say the ship doesn't vanish, but instead eventually burns and sinks. One story from 1900 is kind of eerie. Supposedly some sailors jumped into a rowboat to try and reach the burning ship to save who they could, but it never got any nearer to it, no matter how much they rowed out towards it. And eventually, she just vanished. It's interesting that the original ship could not be traced as well, and that she then seemed to begin haunting the strait. Even today, this is a story of unsolved mysteries, of the ghost ship, of the mysterious unidentified schooner, and why does it periodically reappear? Is there a reason? Now, as I said at the start, there are conflicting dates on when the original mysterious abandoned ship appeared. I've seen the late 1700s, and I've seen the early 1800s mentioned too in different retellings. 
For most accounts, however, you can place them in the window of 1750 to 1850. Anywhere in that century is when most of the stories place the original event occurring. In one example from the early 1800s, which actually ties into what I was saying a minute ago, the that the abandoned ship was a known missing ship. And I've also seen it suggested that the ghost ship could be an apparition of the coal bum, which sank in a storm in 1838. I've also seen it suggested that the original ship could have been a craft looted by pirates, perhaps Captain Kidd, as far back as 1701, which is the earliest date I've ever seen suggested for the original event. And what is seen today, then, is a residual haunting replaying the final moments on loop. Which could also imply that the ship that was found empty and the ghost ship could be two different entities altogether. With the sheer range of dates in mind, perhaps they're unconnected and it's just a coincidence. There was also apparently a ship, and I cannot find the name of it, which just had the worst luck. Apparently being blown off course in a storm, struck by lightning, burned, and sunk with all hands. That's rough, buddy. There's also a theory that it was a schooner which left for Scotland and vanished, and now she aimlessly wanders the strait in search of home. Aside from that, I also just love a good ghost ship story, but what really intrigues me with this story is the story of the ship drifting ashore with no one on board. Again, with the sheer range of dates we're working with here that it could have happened, I could not find if that event even ever happened. But if it did, then that is the more intriguing mystery to me. Which ship was it? Is it one that is listed as missing today? Is it one that we know was abandoned at sea, like the Sea Serpent? You know, what is the story behind that ship? Why was it abandoned? That is what is more intriguing to me personally. Th that specific mystery. And of course, you know, we have to cover some other explanations people have suggested for the ghost ship that do not rely on the supernatural. Even though I still think guardian angel ghost ship that watches over a town is way cooler. How is that not a cool answer? So like with the HMS Eurydice, some people have suggested that the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait is merely a mirage. The easiest and most boring explanation. A specific type of mirage called the Beta Morgana has been suggested to be the cause, which is also perpetrated by some to be the origin of the Flying Dutchman ghost ship legends. Essentially, this is when warm air settles on top of cold air, and this causes light to bend when it passes through that boundary, making really weird imagery, as you can see on screen. It does cause some really weird visual effects. There's a lot of pictures online where you see what looks like ships floating in the air, and, you know, this could definitely explain a few ghost ship legends. You know, this mirage can appear to make things be flying, flipped upside down, distorted, or phasing and shimmering in and out of existence. And this kind of mirage is common in polar regions, and this strait is very far to the north. You're almost on top of the world when you're up there. So perhaps some sightings of this were indeed just a mirage, as boring as that is. Something along the lines of a will-o'-the-wisp could also serve as an explanation for the apparent sight of a burning ship in the darkness. Other ideas put forth are similar, but instead it's say that it's some kind of electrical phenomena. Perhaps some, someone saw St. Elmo's fire around a ship in the strait, and it looked like the ship was bursting into flames, which, fair enough, that would make me do a double take if I saw it. That could make a ship look weird and ghostly for sure. If you haven't looked up what St. Endless Fire is, look it up. It, it does some weird things. And other ideas say that it might just be an optical illusion, you know, a bank of fog making people see shapes when there are none, or even causing uh, reflections of light. Yeah, I'm, I'm still going with Guardian Angel Ghost Ship, and you can't stop me. Anyway, that was the story and mystery of the Ghost Ship of the Northumberland Strait. A fun cool little story that has worked its way into the culture of the town she appears in and has become one of my favorites now after reading it. I just love the idea of Guardian Angel Ghost Ship now watching over the town that found her all those years ago. That is just cool. I think that is a really neat idea. And she has also gotten more widespread attention due to being featured in songs and even postal stamps, so her legend has spread its wings a little bit since... It was for since it first started going around, and that's nice. That's nice. This is an obscure little story, and if you haven't heard of it, I hope you enjoyed hearing about it.
What do you think is happening here? Is there a haunting of some kind happening? A guardian angel type scenario? Or is it just a natural phenomena? Or even a bunch of lies? And what was the story behind the original ship that drifted to shore abandoned? Did it even happen? Who was she? Where did she come from? And why was she abandoned in a very similar way to the Mary Celeste? I'm an open-minded person with the paranormal, and ghost ships are some of my favorites. But I also acknowledge that eyewitness testimony alone is the least reliable form of evidence. I've said that since my first Loch Ness Monster video. So, I'm going to sit in the camp of, I think this is really cool. The folklore and mystery is very interesting, but if the ghost ship exists, I don't know. I've never been there. I've never seen it. I've not looked for it. So I don't know. Maybe there is something to this story, though. With these kinds of stories, the origins always tend to be muddy, which makes trying to solve them much harder. But perhaps some things are not meant to be solved. The Arctic was a steamship for the American company Collins Line. She was a side paddle wheel steamer, just like the Pacific and their two sister ships were. These unique looking gorgeous vessels existed in what I've called the hybrid phase of ships. A relatively small period of time, but due to the ones that in this time period only existing in that small window, as steam was slowly replacing sail power in ships. This resulted in some very unique looking hybrid mixes of later steamships and the previous sailing ships. The Arctic herself weighed 2,856 tons, she was 284 feet long, and she had a beam of 45 feet, and a draw of 19 feet, and a depth of 32 feet. The Arctic, as I said, belonged to the Collins Line. In 1849, the Collins Line had a chance to become a strong contender in the highly competitive transatlantic trade market. That year, the U.S. Postmaster General Office invited different American companies to submit bids and proposals for a 10-year government-subsidized mail service control which would run between New York and Liverpool. We've talked about why this, especially the schedule the ships had to keep, might have become a safety issue in the video where we covered their liner Pacific. The service was hoped to be a direct competitor to the Cunard Line. The Collins Line submitted their plan to operate a weekly service route with a fleet of five ships, and this proposal convinced the authorities to give the line the mail services contract. The Arctic and her sister ships, Atlantic, Baltic, and Pacific, were all built to be luxurious liners. Arctic herself was launched on January 28, 1850, and she was described as an air of almost oriental magnificence and gorgeous yet beautiful apartment, brilliant, with light presenting as cheerful a scene as the heart could crave. With all this love it seems people had for her, she was even the most celebrated of the four sister ships, it makes what happened on September 27, 1854 all the more tragic. The Arctic had left Liverpool for New York on September 20, 1854. She was carrying somewhere between 250 and 300 passengers on board her, 100 of which were women and children. 150 crew accompanied the 300-ish passengers, and on the morning of September 21st, as the ship passed near Cape Clear, the southernmost point of Ireland, she began traveling at full speed ahead, 13 knots or 15 miles per hour. For the next week, the voyage was uneventful, though the weather was settling around her throughout the voyage. On the morning of September 27th, she was at the Grand Banks off the coast of Newfoundland, and she was caught in a dense fog. Cold water was coming down from the north on the Labrador Current and was meeting warm water coming up from the Gulf Stream, and the result was an ever-increasing amount of dense fog. Like her sister ship Pacific would do on the voyage she vanished on, the Arctic continued to plow ahead at full speed. Captain Luce observed the conditions on September 27th and said, At intervals of a few minutes, there was a very dense fog, followed by being sufficiently clear to see one or two miles. And be it that he worked for a company that required the ship to make the crossing from Europe to North America in a certain duration of time, he did not order the ship to slow down, but instead continued to plow on. He calculated that the ship was somewhere around 50 miles southeast of Cape Race in Newfoundland. Minutes later, his ship steamed into a particularly dense bank of fog. All seemed normal and still, but then, the lookout saw something terrifying. Shortly after the captain left the bridge, 
there was something ahead. Materializing out of the fog ahead was another shape. The shape of another ship bearing right down on the Arctic. He gave the crew a warning and the officer of the watch ordered, Hard to starboard! And the engines were ordered to be stopped and reversed. Then, they could only watch as the ship came closer out of the fog and bore down on them. Captain Luce heard the commotion and came back out on deck, just in time for the ship to strike the Arctic. The SS Vesta, the vessel which had struck the Arctic, plowed into her between her bow and starboard paddle wheel. In an eerie similarity to the Titanic decades later, many of the passengers only felt a slight bump, and so did the captain. He thought his ship was relatively uninjured. Many of the passengers were in the middle of drawing the daily lottery and paid the slight shake no mind. In the Arctic Saloon, a passenger named William Guion said he only perceived a slight shake, although it was scarcely more than a tremor or a quiver. Glasses on tables rattled, one or two maybe fell over. Someone here or there might have thought the shaking peculiar, but nothing more than an oddity that would be forgotten in minutes. For the next several minutes, everything continued as normal for the passengers. Guion went back to his conversation with fellow passenger like the bump had never happened. Neither of us entertained any idea at the time that the Arctic had sustained injury, he said. Little did any of them know, at that very moment, water was gushing uncontrollably into the ship and the collision was indeed a death blow. Though many didn't think the Arctic suffered any major damage, the same could not be said for the Vesta. Captain Luce thought the Vesta seemed to be literally cut or crushed off for full 10 feet. Believing his ship was not seriously damaged, he made to assist the Vesta, on which panic had already broken out. He ordered the Arctic six lifeboats to be launched and ferried over to the Vesta to assist her crew. Arctic circled around the Vesta, but only one boat was launched before Captain Luce canceled his order and issued new ones. He noticed that the Arctic was beginning to take on a telltale list and began to worry the damage was more severe than he thought. He also noticed that debris from the Vesta, such as her anchor, were impaled into the Arctic's wooden hull at the point of the collision. Second officer William Ballham was ordered to make an inspection of the damage and assess the ship. Two large breaches were below the waterline, with 18 more above it, and as the ship settled lower, more and more water would be let in through those other breaches. As the Arctic had no watertight compartments, unlike the Vesta, it was suddenly clear from this brief inspection that the ship was doomed if nothing was done at that exact moment. Precious minutes had already been lost, and the race against the clock was now on. Meanwhile, a second officer, William Balham, made his inspection of the damage and assessed the vessel. The mood among many of the passengers began to change as the ship took on a noticeable list and more learned about what had happened. And the, among the passengers who were on board included the wife of the Collins Line founder, Mrs. Edward Collins, who had their 19-year-old daughter, Mary Ann, and their 15-year-old son, Henry, with her. Mrs. Collins's brother and his wife were on board as well. There was also William B. Brown, his wife Clara, their two infant children, two of William's sisters, one of whom, Maria Miller Millie Brown, was a friend of the ship's captain. Also on board was Captain Luce's partially disabled 11-year-old son, William Robert Luce. As the passengers grew uneasy and news of the collision was spreading throughout the ship, Captain Luce attempted to plug the holes. Meanwhile, the ship's pumps were working at full capacity. The plug was just a canvas sail, and it was torn apart by the debris still clinging to the hull of the ship. When they reattempted with something else, the open holes were already too far below the waterline to be plugged. Meanwhile, the lower holds and hulls of the ship were steadily filling with an unstoppable flood of water. Finally, the severity of the situation hit Captain Luce, and he knew that unless he and his crew did something quick, the Arctic, pride of the Collins Line, would sink. His choice was to make a mad dash. The nearest point of land was Cape Race, 50 miles away. Captain Luce decided to make a mad dash for it and try to beach the ship in shallow water. Land was four hours away from their position, but they had no choice if they wanted to save the ship. 
They abandoned the Vesta, knowing if they stayed, both ships would likely sink, and the mad dash to land began. The Arctic plowed ahead at full speed, and at this moment was when one of the first tragic losses of life occurred in the disaster. When the Arctic began her run, one of Vesta's lifeboats had drifted in front of the bow, and the Arctic plowed into it, killing dozens of occupants instantly as they were swept alongside her hull and crushed under the paddle wheels. One person from this lifeboat survived, but the Arctic sailed on, running for land at full speed. Meanwhile, inside her hull, the water was continuing to rise. Corridors were flooding, and the forward sections of the ship were filling. The water soon overwhelmed the pumps, began to rise uncontrollably, and extinguished the boiler fires. By one in the afternoon, the Arctic was dead in the water. Her beating heart had stopped and never was to be restarted. She was stranded far from land with no help nearby and sinking. Captain Luce, knowing the race was lost, then ordered the lifeboats to be launched. The Arctic carried six lifeboats. These boats could carry a total of 180 people. Over 400 people were on board the sinking liner. The lifeboats themselves were still constructed but one of them had already been launched, as I mentioned earlier, and it was left behind when the ship began her run for land, meaning they were down to five. This left room for approximately 150 people in the boats. It was more than enough room for the women and children, and as you'll recall from the HMS Birkenhead story I told, women and children first was an unofficial policy following that disaster. The Arctic's quartermaster started the evacuation with the port guard boat. At first, the women and children were loaded into the boat in a relatively neat order. However, a group of male passengers suddenly rushed the boat to claim whatever spots remained. Once lowered, it was ordered to remain close to the ship, but it pulled away rapidly. Meanwhile, on the Arctic, panic was breaking out. The passengers were realizing the number of spots in the boats was far too few them all. The port quarter boat was then loaded with 12 women and 5 crew, but as it was being prepared to be lowered... It was rushed by more members of the crew, and in the resulting chaos, the boat upended, sending all but three of those on board into the water below. All those who were not left clinging to the boat drowned. Meanwhile, as the Arctic settled lower and lower in the water, and more of her hulls flooded, on the starboard side, Captain Luce ordered his second officer to launch the starboard guard boat and take it to the stern of the ship so the women and children could be passed to it directly, since the ship was settling by the stern. However, just like the port boat, as soon as it was launched, it was suddenly attacked by a mob of men who leapt into the water and climbed aboard. Now that it was full, Balham ignored Luce's orders and drifted away from the sinking ship. Meanwhile, on the port side, the upended boat was righted and, despite the crew trying to get the women and children into the boat, it was again rushed by panicked male passengers who pushed the women and children out of the way, and then once they were in, they cut the boat free from the ship and drifted away with it only partially filled. At the same time, near the stern, one of the two remaining lifeboats was commandeered by the chief engineer and some of his men. They insisted they needed the boat so they could make a final attempt at plugging the holes in the ship. However, when people started questioning them, they pulled guns on them. This boat was then loaded with food and water, and it left the ship only half full. All those on board were engine room staff who threatened anyone who came near them with firearms. Of the crew trying to maintain order, only one officer, 4th Officer Francis Dorian, and Captain Luce now remained on board the stricken ship. All the engineers and seamen were gone, leaving them and a few crew on board with roughly 300 panicked passengers. Only one lifeboat now remained on the Arctic, and the ship was beginning to sink rapidly. Up to this point, it had been growing at a more noticeable pace, but it wasn't a plunge. Now the ship was taking one, going down stern first with a strong list to starboard. Seeing the number of people left trapped on board the ship, most of them women and children, including his own son, a now desperate Captain Luce ordered his ship's trainer engineer, Stuart Holland from Washington, D.C., to go to the bow and station himself there and fire the ship's signal cannon at one-minute intervals in a last desperate attempt to attract any nearby ships that might have been lurking in the fog. Holland would stand there until the very moment the ship sank out from under him and he would not survive. The Baltimore Sun later called him a conqueror of death. That noble ship 
had many noble spirits on board, but none nobler than he. Captain Luce, meanwhile, said, The fate of the ship will be mine. And as the chaos broke out, as the Arctic began to sink, he took his son and climbed onto the starboard side command post above the starboard paddle wheel. There he would wait for the end. He was not the only one accepting their fate. Many stranded passengers huddled together in groups, offering words of comfort and saying prayers and singing hymns and reciting scripture. The image it paints in the mind is a touching and tragic one, even to those who are not religious or spiritual. Others, meanwhile, still made a final desperate attempt to escape, fashioning rafts from chairs, stools, sofas, doors, and whatever else that would float. All this was accompanied by the cannon being fired once every minute. Inside the ship, hallways were submerging, cabins were flooding, tables and chairs were floating, glasses were sliding off tables, and the ship was making crumbling and cracking sounds as the water pressure on her hull increased. The description reminds me of the film A Night to Remember. Though about the Titanic, many of the moments in that movie could be placed directly as they are in a film about this story. Passengers saying a prayer together on the ship as it takes her final plunge, others fighting in the water, others still panicking and trying to create rafts, all the while the water level rises and swallows more of the ship as she takes her final plunge into the ocean. And that is the part of the story we are at. The sinking. Pray. We ought to say a prayer. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will, will be done. Be done. First, we give the deepest of the time. You have to wait for the oil of heaven to fall above us. Oh God, power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Passenger Peter McCabe said of the scene to the New York Times in 1854, Several persons were floating about on doors and beds. I seized hold of a door, which had been taken down to save passengers, and went into the sea, where I left the door and got upon the raft. A great many persons were trying to get on the raft. Among the number who were on it, I saw four ladies. Many of those who were on the raft he described died when the raft got caught up by the sinking ship and was torn apart, spilling its occupants into the ocean and chaos of the sinking ship. The time was now 4.54 p.m., and it had been four and a half hours since the collision, and the Arctic's cannon is fired for the final time. Moments later, the Arctic sank, stern first, into the sea with as many as 250 people still clinging to her as she went down. Captain Luce was still at the starboard paddle wheel, holding his son, until he was sucked down into the water the ship sank out from underneath him. Paul Grant said he heard one fearful shriek and saw the passengers swept forward against the smokestack, and then all was over. Luce came back to the surface and found a most awful and heart-rending scene presented itself into my view. Over 200 men, women, and children struggling together amidst pieces of wreck of every kind, calling on each other for help and imploring God to assist them. Such an appalling scene may God preserve me from ever witnessing again. Captain Luce managed to swim back to the surface while holding his son all the while. As he treaded water, a piece of one of the Arctic's paddle boxes suddenly erupted out of the water next to him, having broken off the ship. The box struck and killed his son while he was still holding him. Luce ended up clinging to that same paddle box, along with 11 other survivors. And then, the Arctic was gone. Second officer Balham's boat stumbled into some overdue good fortune. They encountered the partially filled port quarter lifeboat. The loads of survivors between the two were equalized, with a total of 45 people between them, and then they set off in the direction of Newfoundland's coast, guided by what glimpses of the stars they could get. 
Twice, these two little lifeboats spotted ships, but went unnoticed. And, finally, on the morning of September 29th, they landed at Brog Cove, Newfoundland. The survivors then walked for miles to the village of Renews. There, they were surprised to find the Vesta in the harbor, intact and afloat. She had survived the collision and limped to shore, saved thanks to her watertight bulkheads. Vesta's crew had described the accident as a hit and run by the Arctic. Numerous attempts were launched to look for more survivors of the Arctic. The schooner, John Clement, spent a whole week searching, but only found the Arctic's flagstaff. Other ships only sighted debris. Meanwhile, some of the other lifeboats eventually spotted other ships and made for them. Orion's lifeboat had 31 people in it, 32 once they found Peter McCabe, who was the only one of 72 people clinging to a makeshift raft to survive a freezing night. And they all rowed to the Canadian bark Boron. Meanwhile, Captain Luce and the others who were clinging to the wreckage did so for two days until the sailing vessel Cambria found them. Only Luce and two others of the 11 survived. Three of Arctic's lifeboats were never found, or rather the occupants were never found. Those three boats were the one left behind when the Arctic made her mad dash for land, the one taken over by the engineers, and the one launched under control of the ship's quartermaster. No traces of those people were ever found, except for the lifeboat that had been left behind when the Arctic left the Vesta to try to stop herself from sinking. In November of 1854, it was found empty by the schooner Lily Dale with the oars still inside. Another missing lifeboat, the Port Guard boat, was found that December. Again, completely empty with no sign of those who had been inside of it to be found. In total, of the roughly 400 passengers, 61 crew and 24 male passengers survived. All of the women and children died in the disaster. William Brown's wife, Clara, their two infant children, his two sisters, were all lost, including Captain Luce's friend, Millie Brown. So was Mrs. Edward Collins, her daughter, and her brother's wife. Captain Luce never went to sea again. He worked as a ship inspector for the Great Western Marine Insurance Company until his death in 1879 at the age of 75. Despite the disaster, the Collins Line continued to run its ships at full speed. In 1856, the Pacific would disappear without a trace. A note found in 1861 on a remote island claimed that she had been sunk due to an iceberg collision. In 1857, another Collins Line vessel, the SS Adriatic, was laid up after only a single round trip. Vesta, meanwhile, was fully repaired and returned to service. She sank in 1875. The Collins Line suspended operations in 1858 after both the loss of the Arctic and the Pacific hit them hard. The remaining vessels of the fleet were sold off to new owners. Of the four original sister ships, the Baltic lasted the longest. She remained in service from 1850 until 1880 when she was scrapped. British steam-powered sailing ship, the Lord Spencer, was built in 1865 under the original name SS Java. Her tonnage was 2,696 gross registered tons. She was 337 feet long rounded down, and her beam was 43 feet rounded up. Under the name SS Java, she was built for the Cunard Line in Glasgow by the J.G. Thompson and Company, and she was launched on June 24, 1865. Her maiden voyage was from Liverpool to Queenstown to New York. Later in her career, the Java was renamed to the SS Zealand in 1878, to the Electrique in 1889, and then finally, the Lord Spencer in 1892. Originally, the Lord Spencer was only built to be a sailing ship, 
but she was refitted with steam engines in 1877, and she was then shortly after sold to the Red Star Line and renamed for the first time. Twelve years later was when she was sold to her second owners and given her second name, and then in 1892 she was sold for the third time and given her final name. One passenger who sailed on her wrote the following words. There were only four good ships of the Cunard Company in the Liverpool service in 1873. Russia, Scotia, Cuba, and Java. The two former were side wheelers and were largely advertised as carrying no steerage passengers. Among old travelers, the two latter ships were respectively called the Rolling Cuba and the Jumpin' Java. From the certain peculiarities manifested by these ships in heavy weather, not especially conducive to the comfort of the passengers. Despite this issue that arose when in heavy seas, she must have been magnificent to see in her glory if she left such an impression. One can only imagine what a magnificent sight the Lord Spencer would have been as she sailed proudly across the seas. Even after being outfitted with steam engines, the Lord Spencer still had her sails. Like many other ships from the time, it was very common for steamships to break down because their engines failed. And since this was before wireless technology was put onto ships, then they needed another way to still make it to port, or they would be drifting until hopefully someone else came passing by who could tow them in. The liner California experienced this exact scenario in the late 19th century, when she was found by the Bywell Castle, as did the Wabino in 1868. But her passengers had an even more lucky escape than those of the California. Their ship had struck an iceberg and was sinking when the city of Boston happened to sail by and save everyone before the Wabino went down. The Lord Spencer never undertook such a daring rescue by chance, but she enjoyed many crossings and voyages all over the ocean in her 30-year career and I'm sure that she was loved by many of those that sailed upon her. But her fate was to be a mysterious and tragic one, and one shrouded in many unanswered questions. During a voyage in 1895, the Lord Spencer went missing while traveling her route around South America from San Francisco to New York. No one knows what truly happened to the ship, but a story that a small group of survivors found in a lifeboat from a different ship told after being picked up from the sea tells a chilling story. On a calm night in the southern Atlantic Ocean, the fully rigged sailing ship Prince Oscar was making her way across the seas. She was smaller than the Lord Spencer at 1292 gross registered tons, but their ages were the same. She had also been built and launched in 1865 and it seemed destiny was to bring these two old vessels together in the cruelest way possible. The Prince Oscar was out in the southern Atlantic Ocean on the night of July 13, 1895, off the eastern coast of Brazil, on a voyage from Shields with a cargo of coal. This routine voyage was interrupted by a terrifying sight, one of the most chilling that you could ever see on the ocean at night. The night was routine and quiet, but suddenly, from out of the darkness, the form of a massive passenger liner appeared next to the Prince Oscar. Sailing with no lights on, she was coming straight at the Prince Oscar in total silence. It's like a ghost ship story. It is an absolutely chilling image to imagine, let alone have actually seen. The crew of the Prince Oscar could only watch as this massive dark shape drew closer, and then the two ships smashed together. The mystery ship went down so fast following the collision that no one on the Prince Oscar could get a good look to identify her or maybe see her name. Not that they had time. Their ship was quickly following the ghostly one to the bottom and they rushed to get the lifeboats ready before they went with it. The mystery ship sank nearly instantly and the Prince Oscar followed her in only 10 minutes. For three days, the few Prince Oscar survivors drifted in a lifeboat before they were found by another vessel traveling from London to Melbourne, and they were taken to Philadelphia by a second ship, and this is where that tale comes from. Those lost on the Prince Oscar include Seward J. Anderson, Cabin Boy August Carton, Seaman D. Kelp, Oscar Nielsen, and E. Peterson, and Cook W. Knight. I think that... 
If I could witness anything from this story personally, I would want to see what was going on in the bridge in the wheelhouse of the mystery ship. Did her crew even see the Prince Oscar? Why were there no lights on? Why did it seem like she made a direct beeline for the Prince Oscar instead of trying to turn? What acts of heroism might have played out on the mystery liner as she sank? Someone helping another person up? Someone stepping aside for another to pass through a door first? Helping someone out of a spot they were trapped? Someone going back into the sinking ship for a friend? Crew helping passengers where they could? People becoming trapped with no one around to help them? Panicked screams in the dark hallways and cabins as the water roared inside? And other stories that played out inside the ship are all lost stories to history. The mystery liner sank so fast that the few Prince Oscar survivors barely got a glimpse of her. Of all those on board the Prince Oscar, six survived. Of all those who were on board the mystery liner, none survived. It is thought by many historians that this mystery liner was, in fact, the Lord Spencer. Other ships did vanish in the same area at the same time, but most historians still agree that the Lord Spencer is the most likely candidate for the ship that struck the Prince Oscar, based on the few details the crew of the Prince Oscar could see of the mystery liner. The vague details fit the Lord Spencer over any of those other ships. There are other theories about what happened to the Lord Spencer too, but none of these are seen as likely as the theory of her being the ship that struck the Prince Oscar is. Today, the Lord Spencer does not enjoy the legacy of a liner like the Titanic. She is all but forgotten entirely, as are the stories which played out on her in this final voyage. Her wreck rests somewhere on the bottom of the ocean, undiscovered to this day, and that will likely never change. Do you think this forgotten passenger liner struck the Prince Oscar, or do you think another fate befell her? Tell me in a comment. What started as a typical morning in 1930, a crew were standing on the bridge of their ship when suddenly a shuddering and shaking ran through the entire length of the vessel. And what had moments before been just a typical early morning suddenly had turned in to a life or death situation. Their ship, the RMS Tahiti, was sinking and they were several hundred miles from land or help. But before we get to that story, if you enjoy maritime stories, please like and subscribe so that I know you want to see more of it, and it also really helps me grow. All right, let's get to the story of the sinking of the RMS Tahiti. A forgotten story of incredible bravery and an inspiring fight to save a doomed ship until the very last minute. The Tahiti was a Royal Mail steam cargo ship and passenger liner all in one. She was built by the Alexander Stephan and son of Govan under the name Port Kingston for the direct West Mail Company. She was launched in April 1904 and completed that August. She was 460 feet long and she had a beam of 55 feet, a depth of 24, a draught of 27, and she weighed 7,585 gross registered tons. Within her, passengers could find plentiful accommodations, 277 berths for first class, 97 berths and cabins for second, and an additional 141 cabins for third class. These were spread across four decks, and the passengers were joined by her crew of 135. Her cargo holds were actually refrigerated, allowing for her to carry fruit and perishable goods on crossings. This ship actually had quite the history before her sinking, and we will be summarizing some of it now. In 1907, she was breached in the 1907 Kingston earthquake, which was a magnitude of 6.2 and has actually been called one of the deadliest quakes in recorded history. It caused almost a billion dollars in damage if adjusted to reflect today's currency. The earthquake hit at about 3.30 p.m. local time, and the greatest damage of the event occurred at Kingston and at Buff Bay and a few other spots along Jamaica's northeast coast. A suspension bridge at Port Maria was destroyed in the quake, and the shaking itself lasted for only 35 seconds, but it was accompanied by a roaring sound as if the army of hell itself was climbing out of the earth as it shook. The quake was followed by a total of 80 recorded aftershocks. 
The Tahiti herself, still under her original name at the time, was actually breached during the quake, but refloated. This was lucky and likely saved her, as she'd been docked at the area during the time of the quake for repairs, and a nearby fire caused by the quake actually threatened her. But thankfully, she did not end up burning. A temporary repair that was very quickly done allowed her to be moved to a safer location, an unaffected nearby rail yard. 1911, the ship was renamed to the Tahiti, and she began a new route to accompany her new name. Come the First World War, she was used as a troop transport ship. She was in the convoy that transported the first detachment of the Australian and New Zealand Imperial Expeditionary Forces to the front. Then in 1918, while en route to England, she and the rest of her convoy reached Freetown, and there were reports of a disease outbreak on land that led to the ships being quarantined. But this didn't stop the 1918 influenza outbreak from finding its way on board her. On August 26th, the first soldiers to fall ill from the Spanish flu on the ship reported to her hospital. And by the time the ship arrived at Devonport on September 10th, 68 men had died. And another nine died shortly afterwards as well. In 1930, the Tahiti was still in service and enjoyed the return to peacetime service. On August 12th of that year, while carrying 103 passengers on board her, along with 149 crew and 500 tons of cargo, she was en route to San Francisco after having left Sydney. She was at 20 degrees, 43 minutes south, 166 degrees, 16 minutes west, or 480 nautical miles southwest of the Cook Islands, when, at 4.30 a.m. on August 15th, 1930, a shutter suddenly ran through the ship. Her starboard propeller shaft had broken and torn a large opening into her stern. Water gushed with ferocity into the tear, and the ship began rapidly flooding. Her wireless operators sent an SOS, and her crew began firing distress rockets. The passengers were told there was a possibility they would have to abandon ship. Meanwhile, the crew fought valiantly to save the ship. The longer they could keep her afloat, the greater the chance they all had for survival. They knew this. Staying on the ship itself with a wireless set while it was afloat was a better alternative than floating in the open ocean in the little lifeboats. This fight to keep her afloat was crucial because the ship was so isolated that it took over 17 hours after the opening had been torn into the ship before the first help arrived. The steamship Pinabran arrived on the scene at 10.10 10 p.m. She stood by the Tahiti throughout the night, her floodlights shining on the ship all the while. The rescue ship also had her boat swung out and made ready, her crew ready to go over to the stricken Tahiti and give assistance to her crew and passengers if needed. Finally, the passengers were told to leave the ship. People gathered some of their belongings from their cabins, and at 9.30 a.m. on August 17th, the Tahiti's lifeboats were lowered and all of her passengers and some of her crew were taken off. Essential personnel were left on board the Tahiti because not all hope was lost for the ship yet. The flooding was still spreading and her crew were doing everything to stop or slow it. Meanwhile, another ship, the American steamship Ventura, arrived and signaled that she'd take the passengers and crew from the Tahiti. The passengers were picked up by the Ventura as they abandoned ship. Meanwhile, those of the Tahiti's crew still on board, joined by a boat of crew from the Pinabran and more of the Tahiti's crew that returned to the ship, continued trying to stop the flooding, but it was becoming clear now that it couldn't be stopped. Efforts then began to save the passengers' luggage and mail from the Tahiti's cargo hold because now everyone knew that the loss could only be delayed. No matter what they would do, it would only be a matter of time. The Tahiti was doomed. Now with that in mind, just think for a minute on the guts that it would take to go back inside of a sinking ship not once but several times to save the passengers' belongings and the mail from the holds going several times back inside when you know at any moment she could take a plunge and go down. Aside from the crew staying at their posts in the engine room to fight back the water for as long as they could, only leaving when it became clear the ship was going down and they couldn't put it off for much longer, that is serious bravery and inspiring courage. All around them, the floor would not only have been slanting towards the stern, but also the ship would have been creaking and groaning as water flooded her more and more. Sadly, despite the bravery of her engine room crew keeping to their posts and fighting against the rising water, slowing it as much as they could, she and her crew 
had lost the fight. By 1.35 p.m., the Tahiti began settling rapidly. Water was flooding the lower halls and lapping over the stern, and the crew finally abandoned ship. The, the ship's papers were saved, along with her bullion, and no one went back on board for anything else. Finally, at 4.42 p.m. on August 17th, the Tahiti sank 460 miles from the Cook Islands. Thanks to the valiant efforts of the crew of all three ships, the Tahiti sank without loss of life roughly 60 hours after the stern was damaged. The crew fought back the water and fought to save the ship for 60 hours after the death blow was dealt to her. The Tahiti's sinking was deemed to be due to a peril of the sea which no reasonable human care or foresight could have avoided. And the court of inquiry into the event concluded their session with, we deem it our duty to place on record this appreciation for the conduct of the master and all those under him. And they were right. The fight by the crew to keep her afloat for as long as possible is very inspiring. They fought back the water for 60 hours. They kept the ship's lights running for 60 hours. The ship's wreck today rests somewhere on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, rusting, corroded, and undiscovered. A silent monument to the incredible efforts of the crew, the fight to save her, and of a good ship with lots of history, more than I told in this video. Perhaps one day it will be found, and we will get to see what kind of condition she is in today, as well as the damage that was the death blow. Maybe inside of her are still some clues as to the actions of the crew. Switches in the engine rooms flipped into certain positions to keep the lights and the pumps working to expel the water out. Getting to see those would really tell an incredible story. It would be fascinating to see where all of the switches and pumps are set on. Perhaps one day this story will be adapted into a film. Getting to see the incredible fight to save the ship by her crew would be a very inspirational story to see on the big screen fighting back the water until the ship finally went down i know i'd go see it i think it would be an incredible story for people to know unfortunately this story has been all but forgotten today hopefully though this video and others that are on youtube will introduce some new people to this story of bravery to the very end even when the fight was clearly going to be lost the crew never gave up until it was absolutely necessary for them to leave and i hope one day someone will find her Tell me if you'd watch a film based on this story. I know I would. We all know the story of the sinking of the Titanic. Even people who don't really know anything about maritime history tend to know the story of the Titanic. One of the greatest, most advanced, beautiful, and luxurious ships in the world, seen as a symbol of progress, sinking on her maiden voyage due to an iceberg of all things. Something people thought was in the past, taking 1,500 people with her to the bottom of the ocean as she literally tore herself apart, her lights dimming to a deep red as she foundered. It's a story people know today, and for good reason. But what is not known is the story of a ship from nearly 60 years earlier that also sank on her maiden voyage, and after the Titanic sank in 1912, this one began to be called by some as... The White Star Line's first Titanic. This earlier ship was the RMS Taylor, and today I'm going to tell you the story of this fellow White Star Line vessel that was seen as technically advanced in her day, and like the Titanic, was also lost on her maiden voyage. This is the story of the ship that has been described as the first Titanic. This White Star Line vessel was a fully rigged iron clipper meaning she was designed to be fast. We've talked about clippers before, such as the Sea Serpent, Hurricane, and Romance of the Sea. And if you've seen those videos, you know one thing about clippers is how they were designed for speed. It all came down to the hull shape. The Taylor was designed by Liverpool man William René, and she was built at the Charles Taylor Foundry. She was chartered by the White Star Line after her launch. The ship was 230 feet long, and her beam was 40 feet. She weighed 1,750 gross registered tons, and her cargo holds could hold an additional 4,000 tons of cargo stored 28 feet deep within the ship below her three decks. Her size actually resulted in her maiden voyage being delayed by three months. The White Star Line chartered the vessel to get in on the booming industry of sending trade to Australia. 
Due to gold having been discovered on the continent, trade from the colony was in huge demand at the time, so finally, the ship was ready to sail on her maiden voyage to Melbourne, and she would never return. There were between 652 and 680 people on board the ship. Her captain was 29-year-old John Noble, and her crew of 71 consisted of only 37 trained seamen, and 10 of the crew could not speak English at all. Also, because of the iron hull, the ship's compass was not working correctly. This would be one of the many catalysts that would prove fatal when they finally struck. Because the compass wasn't working, the crew thought they were sailing south in the Irish Sea. They were actually sailing west, straight towards Ireland. Within 48 hours of setting out on January 21st, 1854, the Taylor found herself in dense fog and a storm, and her crew had no idea that they were sailing straight for Lambay Island. With her compass not working, her rudder being undersized, and the ship's rigging being faulty with the ropes not stretched properly, the sails could hardly be controlled by the untrained crew, and it's no wonder that what happened next occurred. Just like with the Titanic nearly 60 years later, crew of the ship suddenly saw something ahead. It wasn't an iceberg right ahead, but instead, rocks. The anchors were dropped right away in an effort to stop the ship, but the chain snapped and it did no good. Just after 11 a.m. on the east coast of Lambay Island, the ship crashed into the rocks and ran aground. The bottom of the ship was torn open in the crash, and she sustained more damage along the hall below the waterline, and water began rapidly flooding the lowest of her three decks. The spot where the tailor struck the rocks was also in a little bay, with almost sheer cliffs on all sides. The ship was essentially right up against one of these walls of rock, being battered by the stormy weather, the huge waves, and the screaming wind. Again, just like with the Titanic, the ship had too few lifeboats for everyone on board, though the unprepared crew did attempt to launch them as the ship began to take on water and sink. The first lifeboat was lowered, but it was smashed on the rocks by the tumultuous weather. It was deemed too dangerous to try and launch the others. So, in an act of ingeniousness, the crew felled one of the masts and the top of it landed on the shore. Since the ship was so close to land, the passengers and crew were able to, despite the storm and intense wind and waves battering them, scramble along the mast onto land. Some of them brought ropes from the ship and tied them to the shore, allowing others to escape the ship safely by pulling themselves along them. Captain Noble, meanwhile, stayed with his ship until the very end. He then leapt overboard and was rescued by one of the passengers. Shortly afterward, the stricken vessel was washed off the rocks by the storm and into deeper water, and she sank, leaving only her masts above the surface. And not everyone had gotten off the ship before this happened, and survivors were left clinging to the masts out in the rough waters of the bay. A surviving passenger who had gotten off the ship then made his way to the nearby Coast Guard station and alerted them to the situation. A rescue mission was launched, and the last survivor who was found clinging to the ship's rigging that was still above the surface had done so for 14 hours by the time he was rescued. By the time the calamity was over and the ship had sunk, only 280 of the 652 to 680 people who had been on board survived. One additional detail is that, out of the 100 women who had been on board the ship in the disaster, only three survived. Their clothing was thought to be the cause. At the time, the clothing that women wore was not ideal for swimming or being ruly and easy to move in if it got wet. It's thought that many simply drowned while trying to swim or after being caught by the bad weather while trying to escape the sinking ship. Crew were blamed for the disaster by the papers once the news had broke that the new ship was lost. An inquiry and the Board of Trade faulted the captain for not taking standard practice when sailing in poor visibility into effect. Many of the causes for the disaster that were determined by the inquiry into the disaster included the compass problems, the absence of a masthead compass, the current in the area the ship was sailing in, the wind driving the ship sideways despite the, the crew trying to control this, the untrained crew themselves, even though they did act bravely in the disaster, the anchor chains breaking, the captain having a fall and injuring his head, and the lack of life belts and the inability to launch what few lifeboats there were due to the storm. I can see why this story is compared to the Titanic. Despite the circumstances being very different, there are still many eerie similarities to the more famous ship, such as the Taylor being a technically advanced ship in her day and never returning from her maiden voyage, and the fact 
that this was a fellow White Star Line vessel just makes it all the more tragic. If only some of the lessons from the Titanic herself had been learned earlier, perhaps some later tragedies would not have been as severe. Or perhaps it would not have made any difference at all. We can only wonder what might have changed. But for now, that was the story of the all-but-forgotten first Titanic. Fun fact, just over a century later, another ship would strike an iceberg on its maiden voyage and also sink. The Hans Hedentoft, which we have covered in an earlier video, struck an iceberg south of Greenland and sank on her maiden voyage in the 1950s, taking all those on board with her. While the wreck of the Taylor has been located, she only sank in 105 feet of water and is just off the coast, the wreck of the Hans Hentoft has not, though we know the area it should be in. And I would be particularly interested, if it ever is found, in seeing the damage that the iceberg did to the hull of this later ship. That, like the Taylor, is also often compared to the Titanic, for reasons alike and different from the Taylor. The lessons the Titanic ultimately taught everyone were thought by many to be ones that would put an end to tragedies like the Titanic, and earlier ones too. But the Hans Hentoft proved otherwise, and it seems that about every 50 years or so, another disaster occurs that is called the Titanic of its day. So that's The SS Tempest was the first ship of the Anchor Line. She was a small but respectable ship at 214 feet long and 866 gross registered tons. She was the first ship in the Anchor Line, which lasted from 1855 to 1980. It was a shipping company founded when Captain Thomas Henderson became a partner in the shipping agency N&R Handyside Company based in Glasgow. His arrival resulted in the formation of the Anchor Line, which was established with the aim of creating a new service that would sail to New York. As I said, the first ship in the new line's transatlantic fleet was the SS Tempest. Tempest was originally a sailing ship, but she was converted from a sailing ship into a steamship in 1856. She served as a passenger liner and cargo liner, and even after her conversion was propelled by both sail and steam power. Still having sails was a key safety precaution due to the fact that in those days of early steam engines, the engines were very unreliable and often failed, and if there was no sails, then a ship would be stranded at sea. This exact thing happened to the liner the California, and she and her passengers drifted until they were found by another ship and towed back to land. Unfortunately, it was less than a year after the Tempest was converted that she would leave New York for Glasgow in February 1857 under the command of Captain Morris, and she would never be heard from again. According to some sources, she only had one passenger on this voyage, with 150 total people on board. The Tempest herself, after being converted into a steamship, undertook her first Glasgow to New York passage roughly four months earlier, in October of 1856. She made the crossing over the ocean in 28 days, and then she returned safely back to Glasgow. Her second trip to New York from Glasgow began when she left on December 27th of the same year, under the command of Captain Morris. On this crossing, she was carrying 50 passengers on board, and again, all went well. She arrived in New York on February 1st, and left again on the 13th. And after this, as we have established, she vanished without a trace ever being found of her, and to this day, the loss remains a completely unexplained and unsolved mystery. So now we come to the question of what happened to the SS Tempest? There are some ideas. Given the, the time of year that she vanished in and the fact that she was in the North Atlantic Ocean, a likely explanation could be her striking an iceberg. A ship striking an iceberg and sinking is not a phenomena exclusive to the Titanic at all. The Pacific likely struck one and sank in 1856. The city of Glasgow also likely did as well. 
Other anchor line ships, such as the United Kingdom and the Ismailia that also vanished, likely did too. The Wabeno did in 1868, and the city of Boston might have a few years later as well. The Hans Hentoff did in the 1950s as well, and even as recent as 2007, modern ships can be lost due to an iceberg collision. Ships from the mid-19th century absolutely could and did fall prey to them. It was not at all an uncommon occurrence. You also have to wonder how that one passenger might have reacted to such a situation. How they were reassured by the crew, what actions they and the crew undertook, and so on. An iceberg collision can also lead to a very rapid sinking scenario or even a slow one that takes place over the course of hours. In that kind of time, the crew likely would have long roused their one passenger after the collision. They also would have had time to assess the damage and so on. Again, if this was the cause. But this is not the only theory to explain this unsolved mystery, so what else could have happened that caused the ship to sink? Perhaps there was no time for all of that. Perhaps something much more swift and sudden descended upon them that caused the ship to vanish. According to some sources, a storm also struck the area the ship should have been in, and it was during the storm itself that she vanished. If verified, that presents Another very probable explanation for the loss, and a very likely one too. Ships being overwhelmed in bad weather was not uncommon back then, and such things could easily explain literally hundreds of cases of ships disappearing. Larger liners of later years can even rock severely in bad weather. Look at the story of when the mighty Queen Mary was very nearly capsized when she was struck broadside by a rogue wave. The mighty Atlantic could have easily swallowed this much smaller tempest in a torrent of mountainous waves of water and screaming wind. And a particularly bad winter storm could easily have created a massive rogue wave that swamped or even capsized the ship. A rogue wave or any other large wave combined with the strong wind that you get in severe storms at sea could easily have overwhelmed the ship. I would say bad weather if the information that she was last seen in a storm is verified or striking an iceberg given the time of year are the most likely explanations, but they are not all the theories that we could suggest. It's just as possible that the ship did not fall victim to a natural hazard. Other things that could explain the loss include mechanical related issues such as a fire breaking out or even the steam engines or boilers exploding. No matter the cause though, the Tempest completely vanished without a trace and she has never been seen again. Her loss is completely unexplained and no known debris ever washed ashore anywhere in the time after the ship went missing. Just like with the Waratah or the city of Boston, there are absolutely no clues to fill us in on what happened. Either way, though, no matter what happened, the SS Tempest and the 150 people who were on board her all vanished, and to this day, the cause for the loss is unknown. The Tempest is still missing. Her wreck lies somewhere hidden on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean to this day, but if she was ever found, perhaps she might still bear the clues of what caused her mysterious fate. And perhaps if she was found, she could still tell us. If the wreck will ever be found is yet to be seen, but I'm not particularly optimistic. Unfortunately, there is not much to tell in this story, so that's going to be the end of the video. I find this ship to just be very intriguing. Maybe because the fact that she vanished with only one passenger on board, or just the total unknowns that are at play in this story and these kinds of things just really sink into my soul and just pull me in and never let go and it really I just want to know you really want to know the answers to the unknown the story what happened did she sink in a storm did she strike an iceberg was she swamped by a rogue wave the questions and the unknowns just grab you and they keep the ship and its story in your mind and you just want to go find them again it's like the it's like the ghosts of the ships themselves and the passengers who were on board grab you and plead with you to tell their stories and come find them so they aren't forgotten. It's one of those feelings you get when you look into the unsolved mysteries that are from the ocean, a place that we cannot go and have a hard time exploring yet has so many stories hidden away, tantalizingly close, but just out of reach. It's the same feeling you get when you see like an abandoned home and you think it feels lonely. And perhaps one day the Tempest will be found and she can tell us her story. Though the wreck by now would probably be in a very sorry state, I'm sure even after all this time, it could still bear the clues to tell us what happened. 
It's the only way we might ever learn what fate befell her and befell her passengers. Or it will remain a secret forever lost to the ocean, and the wreck will be forever hidden, slowly corroding and rotting away until everything is gone, never to be seen by humans again. In 1870, another anchor line vessel, the SS Ismalia, also vanished in a scenario nearly identical to the SS Tempest. Her wreck has also never been found. It is a foggy night in 1898. The SS La Borgogna is sailing at full speed approximately 60 miles south of Sable Island, Nova Scotia. Her visibility is down to 20 yards, but that is okay. The ocean is big, the water is deep, and save for a distant foghorn, no other ships are seemingly around, and there is no danger to the passenger liner. Best to just run her ahead at full speed and get out of the fog as soon as possible. On board are 726 people. The time is just before 5 a.m. on July 4th, 1898, and all is well. In 30 minutes, 549 people will be dead. On this night, tranquility is about to be shattered. Launched in 1885, the French passenger liner SS La Borgogne sailed on her maiden voyage to New York in June 1886, and destiny saw her enjoy a 12-year career following her successful and triumphant crossing to New York, a trip she made in only seven days, something which sparked an entirely new surge in the transatlantic crossing race. She had two stacks, four masts, was 449 feet long, had a beam of 52 feet, a single screw, could reach an impressive speed of 17 knots, and could carry within her accommodations 390 first-class passengers, 65 second-class passengers, and 600 third-class passengers. Despite starting off well, her career, however, was filled with a few incidents which, sadly in hindsight, were almost prophetic. In 1896, she collided with and sank a British steamship called the Alyssa, anchored in New York Harbor. And she was also involved in another collision with the SS Toreador, which damaged her stern, but she did not sink. Other than these collisions, her initial 12 years of sailing were mostly by the book and routine. On July 3rd, 1898, La Bourgogne left New York for Le Harve for what should have been a typical trip. Early in the morning, on July 4th, she was around 50 to 60 nautical miles south of Sable Island, Nova Scotia. The fog was dense, but all was well. The clocks slowly ticked as the minutes went by. Her crew were antsy to get into clear weather, but kept the ship sailing at full speed rather than stop and try to wait it out. Her visibility was down to 20 yards, but La Borgogna plows ahead at full speed. All is well. In the distance, a foghorn is blowing. What would happen next would be so horrific that the French government would attempt to cover it up and bury it forever. The Chromatashire was an iron-hauled sailing vessel built in 1879 by Russell and Co. at Port Glasgow. 
On the early morning hours of July 4th, 1898, she was 50 to 60 nautical miles south of Sable Island. The fog is dense on this morning, and she is blowing her horn. She can hear a whistle in the distance, but she cannot determine where exactly in the fog it is coming from. Visibility is down to 20 yards, so she plows on cautiously ahead into the fog. There are debating recounts of what happened next. Some say that she was sailing at full speed. Others say it was the La Borgogna. Others say it was both ships. But either way, for both ships, suddenly it was clear that they were not so alone as they thought. Or that the ship that they could hear in the distance was in fact not so far away because suddenly they can see each other at 20 yards away. The ships smash into each other. There was no immediately calm afterward like there was on the Titanic or the Arctic, where it would be long before the passengers would know for sure that their ship was sinking. Rather, the SS La Borgogna immediately took a list to starboard. And that wasn't the worst of it. Not only was it clear that the ship had taken a crippling, perhaps mortal wound, but many of her lifeboats on the starboard side were smashed in the collision and rendered useless and the ones on the port could not be lowered because of the increasing list of the ship. Similarly to the SS Arctic in the 1850s, which also suffered a collision on her starboard side, the La Borgogna immediately began to settle by the stern and go under, and all hell broke loose on board. The tranquil night was shattered, calamity spread around the ship, and everything that could go wrong seemed like it was going wrong. As passengers scrambled to get out of the sinking ship and on deck, the crew just began to throw whatever, not whoever, but whatever, onto the lifeboats and launch them, hardly giving the passengers a sideways glance, and that was perhaps the best of what was done. Other crew members decided to not just ignore the pleading passengers, instead, they used their fists or the oars, to beat back passengers as they tried to get into the boats, and a few passengers were even stabbed by some of the crew as they attempted to climb into the lifeboats. The horror wasn't over yet, though. Passengers were calling out for help from the deck, pleading with the crew as they were being abandoned. Others were jumping from the ship, and others still were scrambling to escape the inside as it flooded. A wave of water gushed through the halls, rising in a tumultuous flood like blood seeping in from an open wound. Trapped passengers called for help, but no one came, and the ship continued to sink. And they couldn't get out, and they were left inside as the crew abandoned them all. Remember, this all also occurred not one day after leaving port, and for many passengers, to learn the layout of the interior of a passenger liner like this could take a few days. Now they had to try and escape a ship that they were not familiar with as it rolled more onto its side, rendering stairwells out useless, and all the while, a flood of water was chasing them and rising around their legs. The collision had occurred around amidships on the starboard side, and many of the passengers were asleep. Remember, this was 5 a.m., and many of the passengers awoke from the crash or were thrown from their beds by it, stumbling out into the hall to meet a wave of water that quickly grew knee-high, then waist-high, then chest-high. And the weight of the water pulling on the ship onto her starboard side meant, again, that they had to try to navigate the vessel as the world slowly rolled sideways around them. They were half-awake, confused, scared, panicking, and trying to escape a ship that they didn't know all the ways out of. Perhaps those on the port side had a slight advantage. The water wouldn't have been around their ankles, essentially, as soon as they got out of their rooms. But for those on the starboard side, it was almost a guaranteed death sentence. Nothing short of a true nightmare to imagine. And what valiant actions played out inside the ship, we may never know. Someone holding a door open for someone someone helping another person up, someone freeing someone from their cabin, or someone who was trapped in the rubble from the collision, it was all in vain, as due to an undisciplined rush for the lifeboats, almost all the passengers were left behind to take their chances on the ship. SS La Borgogna sank in 30 minutes. 30 minutes that were nothing short of hell on earth. The last minutes of the sinking were described like this. 
The last few minutes on board the Borgogna witnessed some of the most terrible scenes of horror and cruelty that have blotted the history of a civilized race. Instead of heroic discipline, which so often has been the one bright feature of such awful moments, the crew of the steamer fought like demons for the few lifeboats and rafts, battering the helpless passengers away from their only means of salvation, with the result that the strong overcame the weak, and the list of 162 saved contains the name of but one woman. It sends a chill down your spine. It paints a horrific, vivid image because getting to hear the words of someone who was there, someone who was alive when this happened, it makes it feel far more real than simply reading a write-up about it nowadays. Of the 726 people on board, 549 were lost. Among those lost included Turkish wrestler Yusuf Ismail, whose career led him to face American champion Evan Strangler Lewis in front of 10,000 people, and he won. He claimed this victory in a Championship of the World event. Lewis said afterward, I was licked. The Turk is the better man. Ismail was traveling on the La Borgogna to return to his native village and open a coffee shop or a small market. He never got the chance. French painter Leon Porta was also lost in the sinking. One time, he got to feature one of his paintings in an exhibit of fine art. Many of his works are now proudly housed in several art museums around the world. Leon was only 30 years old. Also lost was American painter D. Scott Evans, who was a teacher and the head of the art department at Mount Union College in Ohio until 1875. He was known for his genre paintings of stylists, women, and rich settings. He and his three daughters were all lost in the disaster. His wife was not on board and later remarried. Others who were lost included Catholic priest Father Anthony Kessler of New York, American Orthodox priest Reverend Stephen Der Stephanian, along with his wife and three children. Three members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which Leon Porta was a part of, the wife and daughter of John Forrest Dillon, an American attorney in Iowa, were also all lost in the sinking. Survivors said that the ship's officers remained at their post after the collision until the end. The fourth engineer and the purser were the only officers who survived. The ship's captain, all of the deck officers, and most of the engineer officers died in the sinking. Survivors said that only the ship's second officer made any kind of true attempt to launch the lifeboats with passengers on board. And according to others, the ship's captain remained on the bridge until the end. He went down with his ship. Surviving crew members were met with furious mobs upon their arrival in New York due to the accounts of them beating off and stabbing passengers, many of whom were Americans. They required police protection upon their arrival to not be lynched by the mob. The French government later covered up the tragedy and blamed none of the sailors of their nationality for the sinking, only those who were working on the ship who were of foreign nationality. You might wonder, what happened to the Cromata Shire? After the collision, she lost sight of the La Borgogna and did not know how severely damaged she has been. At least... Not until the fog thinned. They thought the alarm bells and rockets coming from the other ship as she sank were an offer for assistance, when in reality, La Borgogna was pleading for help. Meanwhile, the Chromatoshire's captain did an inspection of his vessel and found the bow severely damaged, but the Chromatoshire did not sink. Once it was clear that the La Borgogna had sunk, the Chromatoshire picked up 173 survivors from the water, some from La Borgogna's boats, and some from her own, which were launched to assist in the rescue. Among those saved, less than 70 of them were passengers. The survivor ratio was 13% of the total passengers, and of the crew, the total was 48% of all those who had been on board. 
Only one woman of the 300 on board survived. No children who had been on board survived. Almost all of the first class passengers died, with survivors mostly consisting of sailors and steerage passengers. The lack of any women and children surviving, the chaos of the crew essentially abandoning the passengers, has caused many to associate the phrase, women and children last, with this disaster. As for the SS La Borgogna, she has never been found. All we know is that her wreck lies somewhere on the same ocean floor as more famous wrecks like the Titanic. The sinking in which women and children first was most famously put to use, unlike this disaster. This is not the kind of disaster history likes to remember. There was no honor and glory to the end. And thus she, and her horrifically tragic story, and her passengers have almost been completely forgotten. Let's make the effort to remember them and make sure that nothing like this ever happens again.